بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم شباب وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله so um, we starting today to talk about the concentrating collectors um, which is the second uh, uh, type of collectors will be exposed to uh, two after talking about the flat plate collector. Um, we'll just see the main differences here in the shape as well as in, uh, in, in, in the model as well. Uh, the figures that you see here in front of you are basically some sort of samples of these concentrating collectors where the concentration can be made on a line like what we see here in the uh, two figures at the left. So here we have like a parabolic shape. It's like a mirror where the energy falling into it will be reflected and all the reflections are made into a tube. And this tube normally would have a heat transfer fluid, a special type of oils that has a high boiling point like 350 degrees Celsius or so. And accordingly, it can be heated to high temperature. The heated oil is going to get into a heat exchanger. And the heat exchanger will have this oil from one side. From the other side, it may have water, where water will be heated, evaporated into steam. And that steam can be expanded in a turbine, for example, to produce power. So some of the, some of the parabolic troughs or some of the uh, parabolic trough solar collectors are having that. Not necessarily to be a continuous shape of a parabola here, but it could be based on Fresnel lens. The Fresnel lens here, it is just the same thing that you see here, but it's been divided into several sheets. And the sheets are arranged together so that also the energy that is falling into it will be reflected all to this tube in the middle. Then normally this kind of collectors, whether it is a parabolic trough or a trough collector or a linear Fresnel collector are the ones uh, uh, that, that are being uh, having that option of tracking, which means that this parabola can or this uh, set of Fresnel lens that we see uh, at the bottom, they can be rotating to follow the sun so that they can catch or capture the beam uh, component of the solar radiation. To the right side, we have a point collector. Point means that the, this paraboloid shape is having the energy falling into it and all the energy is going to be reflected in a point. This point could be a tank that has water or any fluid. And this is characterized of having a very high temp temperature that it will reach to. The same thing in the bottom shape, which is the tower. We have a large number of mirrors, and these mirrors are all adjusted to reflect the solar radiation into a certain tank here. And basically, many of the solar power plants are having this kind of tower shape. Um, in Australia, there was one that was built some, some something like 10 years ago or so that is surrounded by 500,000 mirror, half a million mirror around it. And all the mirrors are uh, reflecting the energy into this tank. And the tank here is something like exactly like the boiler in a power plant. But instead of heating it with fuel, it is being heated by solar energy. And then it generates high pressure, high temperature steam, which is expanded in a turbine, and the rest of a Rankine cycle sort of thing. Uh, last year, the biggest one, the biggest tower power plant has been built and operated in Morocco. So this is some sort of a technology which is also being used in utilization of the solar energy. For the parabolic trough, this is basically what you have. You have a fluid which is passing in pipes, and then the fluid will be passing in the main focal point of the parabolic trough so that the fluid gets heated and then the hot fluid leaves. Normally, this is a symbolic kind of a figure, but normally this is what you don't want. This is not what you see every, in every application because here it's showing a single trough. Normally, it's a whole set of large number of troughs that are being connected together. This is another 
uh, way to represent the same data. The parabolic troughs are here. And there is a distribution system. So the cold fluid comes in a header, and then it is distributed to every set of this several number of parabolic traps arranged in a row. And then the hot fluid is collected from the other side, and the hot fluid is taken as your source of energy here. On the other hand, the next figure here about the linear Fresnel, it shows this kind of arrangement. The, the mirror could be curved or could be flat. It depends. I mean, both, both are there. And the absorber, again, is at the focal point that receives all the reflected radiation from all these mirrors that we have down there. We also have the dish or the paraboloid kind of, uh, of setup. Actually, they are writing dish or engine because in some applications that had started, uh, even as a trial version, they try not necessarily to put a tank of water here or a fluid to be heated, but they put um, a setup that has a Stirling engine. And Stirling engine is one of the engines that you must have passed by while you're studying uh, thermodynamics too. Talking about some of the engines, uh, you studied the auto cycle, the, uh, the diesel cycle, the dual cycle, and one of them is the Stirling engine where you need a hot surface in, in one end and a colder surface on the other end, and then the engine is somewhere in between. And the tower or the center receiver is somewhere here below to the right or, or, or the lower right figure of, uh, of, of this set of figures here. Another image here is showing those as actual, not a schematic, but actual units. Look at how shiny the surfaces are. You can see that in the parabolic trough here in this part. The surfaces are shiny and actually the surface characteristics are uh, one of the main or important issues that affect the performance of the unit. You can expect that units like this needs continuous cleaning and there are so many patterns that have been made in how to clean these things and keep them always shiny because they are normally placed in the desert. So they are exposed to sandstorms, so sand particles are going to accumulate on the surface, and it will be more problematic if it's a humid area, because the sand, it's not only that's going to uh, cover the surface, but it may stick on the surface because of the humidity. And then a special type of cleaning should be made into it. How to make this cleaning automated, that's another issue. Maybe if you Google that, you can find some trials and some ideas and some patterns that are given just for how to clean the surface. And it has also been like a subject for people interested in surface morphology, like how they can have the surface especially treated in a way that it is hydrophobic to the sand. It does not keep the sand particles, but the sand particles will roll down like the water uh, droplets are going to roll down and they are not going to stay on the surface. And this is normally uh, has been um, adopted or has been a, a point of hot topic for research uh, once people started to discover the nanotechnology. So nanotechnology can be used for treating these surfaces so that the surfaces would be almost clean uh, most of the time. The solar tower here, and you can see here the large number of mirrors. This is only in, in, in one quarter of the site but there is in this area, in this area, in that area. All the mirrors here are reflecting the energy into this tower, which is there on the top, so that you can have very high temperature achieved here. The Fresnel lens is being here at the bottom uh, left figure, and the dish or the paraboloid uh, circular shape is the one that we have at the bottom right side. So these are like uh, the kind of famous uh, concentrating collectors that are being utilized uh, in reality where they can, you can have a multiplication of the energy falling in because of the reflection. And will be coming, will be coming into, we are talking about they are concentrating collectors. So they are concentrating the solar energy and the concentration ratio is among the things that we are going to be talking about today. 
So for many applications, normally we need to deliver energy at higher temperatures compared to what we can get from a flat plate. The energy delivery temperature would be increased by decreasing the area of the heat loss. If you remember when we started the flat plate collector, we said that the, 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 the useful energy that you are getting from the flat plate collector, and the same thing also applies for the efficiency, is going to be coming from a balance of the energy in and the energy out. The energy in is coming from the sun so that it results in heating of the uh, absorber and then the absorber heats the fluid. This is the energy in. The energy out is the kind of losses from the surface of the absorber. And we have even came with uh, a coefficient or a loss factor that will take care of this issue of, uh, of losses from the collector. So one of the solutions is to make the collector area small so that the losses are going to be small because losses are going to occur by conduction, convection, radiation, and all of these depend on the area. Accordingly, the smaller the area, the smaller the losses. And that has been accounted for in the concentrating collectors. So this is done by interposing an optical device between the source of radiation and the energy absorbing surface so that you can reduce losses as much as you can and even having your surface being contained. Remember of what we studied in chapter six when we're comparing the flat plate collectors with an evacuated tube collectors the evacuated tube collectors, if you remember, it was in, in cross-section, it was some sort of a smaller uh, receiver or receiving surface with tubes connected into it. One of the figures that we have that can represent uh, the flat plate collector, I'll just remind you of, it was something like this. A cross-section in the tube can be made like this which is evacuated, and inside you have an absorber plate, which is small, and tube, two tubes are connected into it like this. Sorry. You might remember that, and de definitely they are uh, welded. So accordingly, this distance is small. Accordingly, the kind of heat loss from, the, this, from this is, this is not the same as like a flat plate collector where so many tubes are connected into it. So we're talking about a smaller area. And what helps here also is that if you apply vacuum so that you are suppressing uh, convection and conduction, and then you are through the, <coughs> the evacuated tube collectors, you are able to reach for higher temperatures compared to the flat plate collector. Here we are in a position that the, the temperature or the surface area of the receiver is even smaller. And accordingly, you can get higher and higher temperatures in addition to the issue of the concentration. So in this chapter, I'm going to relate uh, a couple of, uh, of types of collectors. One of them is what we call the non-imaging collectors and the imaging collectors. We are going to talk about these in details in the next few slides. They have to do with the concentration ratio mainly. Many designs have been there. The designs are so many, so that at the end, one would say that a single method for analysis would not fit because of the many differences that we have there. The concentrators could be reflectors or refractors, which means that the reflective, reflective energy can be diffuse or specular. And they could be cylindrical or they can be circular. They can be fixed or they can be rotated. Or they can be a continuous part like the parabolic trough or segmented like the Fresnel kind of, uh, of reflected. So we have so many varieties when we are talking about concentration, concentrating collectors. Okay. Yes. Uh, what about uh, the constructing uh, 
material um, because um, it's a solid at the end. Uh, is it going to be different than uh, the flat plate or is it the same? Uh, what do you, which material do you mean? The material uh, for, uh, the, uh, for the plate itself. Yani. Well, this is a good question because it depends on what is the range of temperature. If you are going for very high temperature applications, then you need to uh, pay special attention to the material so that they can withstand the temperature that you are applying. So that's something, again, that needs to be looked at. Maybe for, uh, for the flat plate collectors, in, in many cases, even for those who are pla planning to do like a handmade collector themselves, maybe they can get sheet of a galvanized iron or carbon steel and paint it with black and that would be it. And they would not do uh, a substantial effort in selecting the material. Here, the situation is a little bit different. It's not only that, but even when you are talking about these collectors, the kind of structure of uh, uh, the stands on which these collectors are going to be installed, it needs a special attention and the, co the corresponding conduction losses are more than what you see in a simple flat plate case. Did I, ask you, did I answer your question? Yes, thank you, Doctor. So we're talking about the receivers also, they can be flat receivers, they can be concave, they can be convex, depending on the application or the type of collector that you have in hand. They could be covered, they could be uncovered. So we're talking about varieties that are so wide when it comes to concentrating collectors. Tracking can be done and tracking here can be again, tracking on a single axis. The axis could be, for example, pointing uh, from pole to pole or pointing from east to west or parallel to the earth like what we covered in chapter two and then it can be a single axis tracking so that the rotation becomes in one direction or it can be a double axis react, uh, tracking as well so that it can rotate to follow the sun and keep the incident angle in as much as possible a normal uh, uh, position accordingly you are maximizing the amount of gain or the amount of energy in into your collector. Uh, that's why with this wide range of designs, it's difficult to develop a generalized analysis that can take care of all the concentrators, but rather each one of, or each type can be dealt with as a special case. So we talked about two groups, non-imaging collectors, with low concentration ratio, whereas the linear imaging collectors are going to have intermediate concentration ratios and relatively speaking, intermediate range of temperatures. Uh, in some cases, three-dimensional concentrators that can operate uh, at the high end of the concentration ratio scale, like what we, use, what we do in solar furnaces where the temperatures can exceed a thousand uh, Celsius, and this is normally used like for metal forming or so. And this normally would be some sort of a par paraboloid or a dish sort of, uh, of, of, of collector. The concentrations that have concentration ratios with values of the concentration ratio that can go from unity or less than unity to something in the order of 10 to the power of five. The higher the concentration ratio, the higher the temperature, the, the more sophisticated it becomes and definitely much more expensive. Increasing the ratio means increasing the temperature and different, as, as I mentioned, it becomes more expensive because you have to have it being done with more precision and of high optical quality so that the reflections can be as perfect as possible. So if it needs to be tracking the sun, it has to be very accurately tracking the sun so that you can make use of all the energy falling in. And by this, I mean specifically the beam component of the radiation. So the cost of the energy then becomes a function of the temperature that you want. 
if you are talking about lower cost units, maybe you'll go for the flat plate collectors, then evacuated tube collectors. And then as your needs for temperatures would increase, you are going to go for more and more sophisticated systems that would have temperatures which is raised from several hundreds Celsius to something that can exceed 1500 or 1500, for example. At the highest range of the concentration and precision of the optics, the concentration collectors are cold furnaces. So whenever we are talking about very high temperatures, then we are talking about what we call furnaces or solar furnaces. And normally they are used in laboratories or even field units for the sake of studying the material properties at high temperature and also for high temperature processes. We have, uh, in 2009, we have visited um, a place in Spain, in, in one of the cities of Spain called Almeria, or uh, to be translating the name, it will be Al Almeria. And this place in Almeria is, uh, uh, they call it Solara, uh, Solara pl pl uh, Platform or Platforma, and it is actually one of the places where they are applying solar energy and it is hosting most of the projects that are funded by the European Union. Why Spain? Because Spain is known of its clear sky in comparison with other uh, European cities. That's why most of the applications related to solar energy can be made there. And they have different types of solar collectors. I don't recall that I've seen a, a flat plate or a parabo or, or a, uh, an evacuated tube solar collector there, but I've seen the Fresnel collectors, I've seen the parabolic tube collectors, and also I've seen that solar furnace, which is a dish type of collector. And according to what they said, it has temperatures uh, that can reach on the surface of the receiver, or I mean, the, the after reflection, which is something in the order of 1,500 degrees, which is substantially high temperature. The main concern in this chapter is related to the energy delivery system at low and intermediate concentrations. So I'm not going to focus on the high-end con concentrators that are resulting in very high temperatures. Concentrating collectors are making uh, problems that are slightly different from what we've seen in, in the flat plate collectors. They must be oriented to track the sun so that the beam radiation can be directed into the absorbed surface. So we rely more on beam radiation component here. Uh, the designer has available a range of configurations that allow new sets of design parameters to be manipulated. So we're going to look at different or additional design parameters that we have not seen while looking at the flat plate collectors. Definitely, they are coming with new requirements for maintenance, especially quality of the optical system for a long period of time. In the presence of, I just mentioned the issue of weather conditions, talking about sand, storms, and humidity. Dirt is a part of it, oxidizing or corrosive atmospheric components, that's something that you have to worry about as well, which means that the surface has to be treated in a way that it will be anti-corrosive uh, surface. The combination of operating problems and costs have restricted the utilization of concentrating collectors, which means that you cannot use uh, concentrating collectors if you are working on another project with limited budget, because they are costly in terms of acquiring as well as maintaining the collectors. We are talking about solar energy, which has not been full, fully utilized, but with time as uh, as the more dependence of solar energy comes into the picture, the prices are going to go down. For example, the PV panels, which are producing electricity, have decreased by about 70% in price in the last 10 years. Why is that? Number one, it's the development of the manufacturing technology. And number two is the widespread of them. Whenever you are selling so many units, then prices are expected to get down and people are going to get into the market, creating competition. And this is all for the benefit of the consumer. 
So if, there, if there's more dependence on solar energy, then these components are going to be lower in price as time passes. You know that the vision 2030 of the kingdom is talking about at least 50% of the power will be produced by solar energy. So you expect more and more dependence on solar energy in the next few years. It's not only that, but I can anticipate that in some places, like Spark, for example, they are going to have factories that would manufacture solar collectors, different types of solar collectors. It can be flat plate collectors, which is already being done now. You have locally manufactured flat plate collectors, but I would see that we are, all, we are also going to see evacuated tube collectors and parabolic trough collectors. And that's something that is coming in the next few years. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that it will be locally manufactured as well. Uh, given that there's uh, in, in many places in the kingdom, the quality of the sand is so high that it is very useful in the optic uh, industry. We're going to rely on some terminology that will be used throughout the chapter. This terminology are going to be, we'll be talking about a collector, and whenever we're talking about a collector, we are talking about a combination of the receiver and the concentrator. So the concentrator is an integrated part or integral part of the collector now. The receiver is the element of the system where radiation is absorbed and converted into another type of energy, mainly heat. It includes the absorber, and it is associated with the cover and the insulation to reduce the losses. The concentrator or the optical system is a part of the collector that directs the radiation into the received surface. So this is where the reflection of the energy is going to be. This is the mirror shape, the shiny surface that reflects most of the radiation falling into it. And then we are talking about the aperture of the concentrator, which is the opening through which the solar radiation enters the concentrator. To make this, uh, because we have seen this uh, these words before, and we have been, we have been exposed to what is meant by a collector, and we have seen what is meant by an absorber and a concentrator. The word aperture is maybe relatively new uh, terminology or new words, so it probably would be uh, worth and to look at um, what do I mean by aperture. You can see it here. This shaded area is what we call the aperture. Not only this, but there's another figure that I remember I got it last uh, yesterday, which is this. This is the aperture area. So this is the area through which the solar energy is going to go through to, in order to be falling into the receiver. I thought this, or maybe here, this A, small a, is the aperture area, where A sub R is the receiver. So now I would, I would guess that you have an idea what is meant by aperture area. Going back to the terminology. So it's the aperture area here that is the opening, and, and this opening could be necess not necessarily uh, a lens. It could be a lens or a mirror shape. It depends on the collector that you have. This chapter has the first four sections talking about general information on optical properties, heat transfer, which is are important uh, to go through for the concentrating collectors analysis. And then we'll be looking at cylindrical absorbers over diffuse reflectors. And you know what diffuse reflectors mean. And then after that, we're going to treat what's called the compound parabolic concentrator, the CPC collectors, and these are very common type, which you can find in the industry associated with intermediate temperature ranges. So uh, th the chapter is, divine, is, is devised this way. And what we will not be looking at is the high end or the high temperature applications. That's something are going to be beyond the scope of this chapter. These are some configurations of the collectors. We have A, B, C, D, E, F. So I have six uh, configurations that you can see here. The six configurations can have a reflector, which is in the form of a flat plate with diffuse 
kind of radiation. What diffuse means? It means that the energy which is falling, part of it will be falling on the tubes itself directly, and part will be falling in between the tubes. So that's why we added a plate here. This plate is, it can be like blackened, for example. So that it's not shiny. So the energy falling into it are not going to be reflected as specular radiation, but the plate itself gets heated and then it would radiate its energy in all directions of space. And this is what's meant by diffuse radiation. On the other hand, it can be made in a, in, in a a shape like a cup like this, so that the energy falling into it is going to fall into a shiny surface and then be reflected into the collector or into the, uh, the cylinder where the receiver is. Or it can be uh, some sort of a little more than a flat plate collector by having these two sides are added to it. All of these are easy to manufacture. They are easy to build and they are not expensive energy is going to fall through this, is going to be reflected on the absorber surface. So there's energy falling into the absorber surface directly, energy falling into this shiny surfaces that will be reflected here. So you are using uh, reflectors to um, improve the performance a little bit. The, the, the percentage of improvement is not large. It's not like what you can see here in D where you have a parabolic shape where the energy falling is, is going to precisely be uh, reflected on this receiver. And the same thing here for the Fresnel type of collector for this E, the Fresnel reflector, or the array of heliostats that are um, reflecting the energy into a tower. Going to each one of them in, in, in further details, the first two arrays of evacuated tubes, which are these, we have evacuated tubes, and then the tubes, on the back of the tubes, there is a surface. The surface could be a flat, like in A, or it can be taken as a, a cup shape, like what you have seen here in B. So it's the first one is a flat diffuse back reflector. The second one is a cup shaped specular reflector. In C, we have a plane receiver with plane reflector with edges, which is this. It's, uh, it's a little bit uh, modification to the flat plate collector by just adding this side reflectors, as you can see here. Concentration of this type is low, and you cannot have a concentration more than four. I mean, it is always less than that. So this is the limit of this type of collectors. Some of the diffuse component of radiation instant of the reflector can be absorbed by the receiver. And this is what you rely on. The surface will be getting heated and then it's going to um, uh, re-radiate its heat or diffuse heat to the surrounding surfaces. These collectors can be looked at flat plate collectors with improved or integrated or augmented radiation coming from the two surfaces that are uh, on both sides. Figure D, however, is talking about a, a reflector of a parabolic section that can be a cylindrical surface with tubular receiver or a surface of revolution with spherical or hemispherical receiver. So it can be uh, like a cylindrical shape, or it can be like a dish type of, uh, of receiver. Cylindrical collectors uh, have been studied in some detail, have been applied. The continuous parabolic collector can be replaced by Fresnel reflectors. So it doesn't have to be a continuous uh, shape like what you see here, but the figure was showing us, rather than having a continuous shape like this, it is being divided into Fresnel type of, of mirrors, and that the Fresnel type of mirrors are lighter and they are easier to, uh, to put together. However, they need, again, precision so that you need to know what would be the angle of each one of them so that you would make sure that it's going to reflect on this focal point or what we call the vortex of the shape. The, uh, the facets of the reflector can be individually mounted and adjusted in position as, as we have seen in the first one, in the first figure. I'm talking about the uh, 
the Fresnel type of collectors, where each one of these can be uh, can be made and be adjusted individually. You are talking about a set of uh, rectangular shaped mirrors, and they are going to be set together where you can do the adjustment, which can be done either manually or it can be automated. Large arrays of heliostats of this type with receivers mounted on a tower are basic designed for central receiver. This is what we see in figure F, the last figure where you have large number of mirrors on the ground and all of them are reflecting their beam radiation into a tower which is at a high elevation. It is receiving all the energy and reaching for a few hundred degrees of temperature. For the concentration shown in the figure, the six ones, Single-sided flat receivers may be used. Cylindrical, hemispherical, or convex shape can also be utilized. In general, the concentrators with receivers that are much smaller than the aperture are effective on beam radiation. And you'll see here, it's beam radiation basically that we are uh, relying on for effective heating. The angle of incidence of the beam radiation on the concentration is important. You don't need your reflected energy to go out of focus, go, go far from the vertex or from the target tube that would be heated. And here comes the precision or the value of the precision in making sure that the reflected energy is going to be utilized in heating the fluid that you have in the pipe. A variety, a variety of ori orienting mechanisms are being designed to move in order to focus the collector so that the incident beam radiation will be reflected to the receiver. The motion required to accomplish this tracking is going to vary according to the design of the optical system. And this motion can be uh, maybe through uh, a single system or a, a, a more sophisticated system. It depends on the kind of, or the axis that you need to have uh, to have the rotation across. You can have rotation across one axis only or rotation across different axes or a couple of axes, for example. Like the figure that you see here in, the, in, in, in this slide is it's basically a two axis uh, reflector and it, it is moving in two directions. One of them is tilting around this axis here. And you can see even the gears that are making this kind of rotation. The other one is the whole one is moving uh, uh, around uh, a vertical axis. And it is moving in, uh, in, 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 in different, uh, like up to 36 degrees. Linear or cylindrical optical systems will focus beam radiation to a receiver if the sun is in the central plane of the concentrator, which is going to result in reflection in the focal axis or the vertex lines of the or line of the reflector. These collectors can be rotated about a single axis of rotation. And this is normally what you see with parabolic trough collectors, that they are going to move with according to one and one axis and they are going to rotate and follow the sun in the sky and normally they are done in a parabolic shape so that upon rotation they are going to um, follow uh, the path of the sun and reflect uh, the, the incident radiation into the, the focal point or the vertex where the tube is located. Over the night they are placed, they are turned it down so that uh, they do not accumulate um, um, like dew from or, or water vapor or water droplets would not be there as well as the sand will not accumulate. The rotation is going to follow a certain um, a rule of thumb of 50 degrees, 15 degrees per hour. And accordingly, if they are adjusted, uh, normally it, it will be done in, in an automated manner so that it would just uh, move automatically by 15 degrees every hour. There are significant differences in the quantity of the incident beam radiation, its time dependence, the image quality obtained with these three modes of orientation. The reflectors 
that are surfaces of revolution, which are the circle concentrator, generally should be oriented so that the axis and the sun are in line. And in some of them, they should be able to move about two axes, like the one, like the figure I just mentioned here, so that it can precisely uh, follow the, 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 the sun or get the beam radiation from the sun in an effective manner. The axis can be horizontal and vertical, like this one. There's one axis which is horizontal, the one which is moving by the two gears that you see uh, in the figure. I'm talking about specifically uh, this gears that are rotating it around this axis. So the rotation here is going to be in this direction. Or, and the other one is around a vertical axis. So one axis is horizontal and the other axis is vertical. The angle of incidence of beam radiation on a moving plane is indicated for probable modes of orientation of the plane. And the equations that we have covered in, in section one, one seven in chapter one are basically the ones that are going to be utilized here. We have taken equations that are representing the angles and this is the base for our uh, setup so that you can make your angle changes and follow uh, follow the sun so that you can have always a high component of the beam radiation. The orientation system can provide continuous or nearly continuous adjustment, which means that it can be automated to keep on changing all the time, or you can adjust it from time to time, depending on the position of the sun. For the low concentration linear collector, you can adjust the position intermittently weekly or monthly or seasonal changes that are possible for some designs. Others would require continuous or orient orientation system that would be based on manual or mechanized operation. The manual system depends on the uh, experience and the skills of the operator so that he would know that now I should change it at this moment and change it by this amount of angle in this direction or that direction. So it depends on the human factor a lot. So that the operator would make necessary corrections. And in some cases that's adequate, that's good enough. If you are looking for a relatively small concentration and the cost of the labors is not too high, then would be th that's th that's something that can be useful there, or it can be economically uh, a viable solution there. Just put your collectors and put somebody there, and he is going to adjust it manually uh, whenever needed. The mechanized orientation can be sun-seeking systems or programmed systems. The sun-seeking systems are going to use detectors the detectors are going to feel the motion of the sun and then trigger uh, the whole the whole uh, the whole uh, uh, tracking system to follow the sun or it can be programmed you can write a program and you have a motor that can execute the program and precisely follow the sun in a continuous motion then you just need uh, the human factor only for checking from time to time to make sure that the alignment is correct. And here it's saying that you, you can make a use of both, like tracking as well as programmable uh, sort of tracking systems. And that's something that can be done, a combination of uh, superimposing small corrections by sun-seeking mechanisms with the motor or the, uh, the kind of uh, programmable system that you have so that adjustments can be done um, automatically, whenever needed. By the way, for this, again, when it comes to the end of the day, the system should be putting the reflector upside down. Like if you are talking about a flat plate collector, for example, during the day, the flat plate collector is going to be done in a way which would be looking like this. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm talking about a parabolic plate co uh, parabolic uh, collector. So energy of the sun is falling like that. Over the night, it is turned like this so that it is facing down so that it does not collect, uh, I mean, humidity will not make it wet as well as it is protected from the sand. 
normally the humidity is going in the outer surface and what you care about is the shiny surface which is inside so they turn it upside down after sunset until the next day in the morning where it is going to be rotated back again to be facing the sun one more thing here which is also equally important is that uh, i'm talking about the stowing position where it can be uh, it can be done also to in a way that it should uh, be strong enough to resist the wind without damage and that's something that has to do with the way that you are installing the uh, the stands that are going to carry these uh, concentrators now coming to the concentration ratio so multiplication of the rate of energy which is incident in the reflector so that the absorber is going to receive much higher energy than or compared to the case where the absorber is just uh, relying on its area to get directly energy from the sun. The most common definition of the concentration ratio is the area concentration ratio. How much is the area of the aperture to the area of the receiver? And this is going to be some sort of a multiplication or a concentration ratio. So it depends on the area here. A flux con concentration ratio is defined as the ratio of the average energy flux on the receiver to the aperture. But generally, there are substantial variations in the energy flux over the surface of the receiver. And that's another thing that we are going to get into in, in the next few slides, there next time. A local flux concentration ratio here can be simply given as the ratio of area of the aperture divided by the area of the receiver. So this is what we call the area concentration ratio. This ratio has an upper limit that depends on the concentration is uh, a dish type of or a paraboloid or a circular concentrator or a two dimensional linear like the parabolic trough concentrator. Example is given here. And this is basically the slide that was showing the aperture area and talking about the concentration uh, ratio here through the area is clear in this figure because you can see here that there is a concentrator and the concentrator is having a bigger area which is basically reflected by red, uh, the red rectangle that you see here. And this is going to be compared with a smaller area of the receiver here. So the ratio between the area of this surface an area of the receiver is the concentration ratio that we're talking about. How to account for that? Basically, this figure is given for uh, this estimation. The development of the maximum concentration ratio has been done by Rubble in 1976, that he based his work on the second law of thermodynamics applied to radiative heat exchange between two surfaces, sun and receiver. Considering a circular shape of the concentrator with aperture area A sub A, receiver area A sub R, and viewing this with respect to the sun that has a radius of small r and a distance from the sun to the collector is about capital R. And then the angle here, or the half angle actually, is because basically that should have been like this. But because of the symmetry, they have just studied part, the half of it. So this half angle subtended by the sun is theta s. And actually, in this case, the, the aperture here and the receiver is on the back as if that this is some sort of a lens, but the same thing can be applied if if this one is here as well. We are looking now at the aperture area. If the concentrator is perfect, then the radiation from the sun on the aperture and the receiver is the fraction of the radiation emitted by the sun, which is received by the aperture. The maximum concentration ratio of circular concentrator is given here. Area of the aperture over the area of the circular. The area is basically by R square. So the ratio is capital R square over R square, small R square. 
which is 1 divided by sine squared theta s. Whereas for the linear concentrator, the area is basically uh, is, is, is different. It is uh, 2 pi rl. So it's the ratio of the radius, not the radius square. Accordingly, the ratio is 1 over sine theta. If sine theta, if theta is 27 degrees, then the maximum possible concentration for a circular tube is one over one over sine square 27. That gets a value of about 45 thousandths. For the linear one, it is about 212. So this is the maximum uh, concentration that you can get for a circular shape as well as for uh, a linear uh, kind of of, of collector. So this one is the maximum for a circular shape, whereas for the linear one, the maximum is 212. This is significant. And probably now looking at this, you can see why we are getting so high temperatures. It's because of we are able to magnify the amount of energy falling onto the receiver by a significant number that represents the concentration ratio. The higher the temperature, the higher should be the concentration ratio, definitely. But your optics have to be very precise so that they can reflect uh, the, the, the falling energy into your target receiver. We have a figure here that shows the practical range of concentration ratios and the types of optical systems that are needed to deliver the energy at various temperatures. And in that, we have two categories. Again, I'm going to talk about the non-imaging concentrators that do not pre produce clearly defined images of the sun and the absorbers. They have basically a concentration ratio that is generally less than 10. So the non-imaging kind of, of reflectors are, or the concentrators are producing a concentration ratio less than 10. The imaging concentrators and clocks are, are analogous to the camera, camera lenses. They form images of very high, uh, of, of, of very low quality by ordinary optical standards on the absorber. Now, this kind of, of figure that you see here is doing this kind of representation. So the concentration ratio versus the receiver temperatures. You can see here the receiver temperature can be much less be below 500 degrees centigrade for a lower limit, whereas the upper limit is, as the figure shows here, it is corresponding to higher temperature and higher concentration ratios. And where the cylindrical shapes are interfering is shown, where the conical shapes and the paraboloid shapes, which is the highest in terms of producing uh, temperature and using high concentration can be seen here to the, which is the, uh, the one to the left side, I mean to the right side, sorry, where the temperature is high. When it comes to performance, again, the two elements are there. One element is how much energy is being received and how much energy is being lost. And this is what we need to determine. Maybe we can start by looking as, as we did in chapter six, look at the overall loss coefficient, where we have, if you remember for the flat plate collector, we have top loss coefficient, and then we have a combination of bottom and, um, and, and, and end loss coefficients. And the combination of them is in terms of UL or the overall, uh, U is basically an overall heat transfer coefficient uh, expression. So the calculations of the performance of the concentrating collectors is going to follow the same general outlines as we did for the flat plate collectors. However, the areas here are different and accordingly, it's not going to be exactly what you did in a flat plate collector, but it's slightly modified based on the geometries that we have for the system. The energy falling or absorbed at the surface, S, is going to be estimated from the radiation and the optical characteristics of the concentrator receiver. The estimation of S is going to be uh, discussed in details. The thermal losses, on the other hand, should be estimated, usually in terms of a loss coefficient UL that is based on the receiver area. 
temperature gradient are expected to be high in this case that are occurring along the receiver. Um, a flow factor is going to be considered to allow the use of any flow temperature in the energy balance calculations. And this is what we also done in the flat plate collector. We got all uh, our parameters or expressions of Q, expressions of the efficiency are given in terms of the inlet temperature of the fluid N. So here we are going to look at the determination of the overall loss coefficient as well as the flow factor FR. Thermal losses and losses are normally occurring as we have seen in chapter six and it's been introduced in chapter three that we are having losses by conduction, convection and radiation, which means that uh, there are going to be losses. For example, when we are talking about the stand which is carrying the, the collector, this is conduction losses because as the, the reflector gets heated, it is physically in contact with the stand. So heat is going to be conducted through the stand and it will be lost. And how to come up with a stand of uh, low thermal conductivity, but have uh, like uh, uh, characteristics of, uh, of, of being able to carry that, uh, that system, especially if the system is, is rotating or it has uh, rotation or tracking, uh, either one or two, or two angles. Normally metallic, they are made of metals and metals are known to have high thermal conductivity. Can we make them of polymers or plastics or different materials with low thermal conductivity and yet economic to reduce the losses? That's an issue that needs or an area that needs to be considered in, uh, in, in, in future. The shapes and the designs are changing widely. Temperatures are higher. The edge effect are more significant compared to the flat plate collectors. And conduction, according to what I just mentioned, is expected to be much higher. A flat plate collector, you can put an insulation at the back of the receiver and that's it. But here it's not only a receiver. We have a receiver and a reflector. And the reflector have to be carried by a mechanism and stand that will fix it firmly to the ground so that it can withstand the wind effects, the forces exerted by the wind and it should not be broken. So all of this needs to be con considered as, uh, as the system is operating or when you're designing it. Problems can be also be a little bit complicated by the non-uniformity of radiation flux on the receiver that would create substantial or large temperature differences across the energy absorbing surface itself. So the issue of assuming a uniform temperature everywhere might not be the case here. And that complicates the calculations a little bit compared to what we have seen in, uh, in, in a flat plate collector. If you remember a flat plate collector, we just uh, focused on a couple of things. One of them was uh, assuming that a uh, receiver, which is connecting two collectors, is like a fin, extended surface, and we applied the fin uh, energy balance there, and we got the temperature distribution. And we have also considered the convection part with the heating of the fluid as it passes across the tubes. So these were the two elements that we focused in the flat plate collector. Here, the situation is slightly more complicated due to the nature and the geometry of the collectors we are looking at. Accordingly, we cannot present a single general method that applies to all concentrating collectors. That would not be the case, but each one of them is going to be treated as a special case. Thermal losses are uh, basically some components that you have seen. I mean, you are talking about losses, then you are talking about heat transfer and the modes of heat transfer are there conduction, convection, and radiation. So we're going to talk about the three of them. Receivers may or may not have covers. If they, then they are, we have to account for the transparent covers in calculations of the energy losses as well. 
So outward losses from the absorber by convection and radiation to the atmosphere are modified in equations similar to what we've done in chapter six, in the sense that what we're talking about here is basically the basic equations. If you are talking about losses by convection, then you need to account for Newton law of, of Newton cooling of uh, Newton law of, of cooling. And the Newton law of cooling, which is Q is equal to H area into the temperature difference, then the determination of H is an, a key factor here, how to de determine the value of the heat transfer coefficient by convection. Radiation, we have seen radiation, it depends on two surfaces or a surface and the surrounding sky. And we have seen also the linearized heat transfer coefficient, HR, and how it can be integrated in the expression of the losses. So, so that's something which is not new to us. Conduction losses are going to be considered by Fourier law of conduction, where you are going to get uh, uh, the thermal conductivity or equivalent thermal conductivity if you have more materials and more mediums. And then uh, that would be your tool to estimate the losses of the collector. The losses are estimated as independent of the intensity of the solar radiation. We're talking about a surface at a certain temperature that needs to, or that that we are calculating the energy losses from it. How the sand, how the surface is receiving radiation, it's not, it's not the focus here because we are, we are basically looking at losses. The effective transmittance absorbance product can also be defined for focusing systems. Furthermore, with focusing systems, the radiation flux at the receiver is such that the cover material with very low absorptance of the solar radiation can be used without thermal damage to the cover. So that's something that is related to what kind of characteristics for the cover that should be used. Conduction losses occur through the supporting structure. And this is now, as, as indicated earlier, it's a substantial loss which is occurring to the uh, uh, to the system because we have to have some sort of a rigid, strong support of the collector that is connecting it to the ground. And accordingly, that source of, of conduction loss that cannot be avoided. Since we've done the analysis of the flat plate collector, so we'll try as much as possible to have some sort of analogous uh, expressions of the useful energy and the efficiency so that it looks like similar when you are talking about the equations in general. It's not necessary, but this is just something which is being made for convenience. So we're going to talk about the collector efficiency, F dash, loss coefficient, UL, and collector heat removal factor, FR, as we did for the flat plate collector. Once we know the value of FR and UL, the collector useful gain can be calculated from a similar expression of the flat rate collector, and then we can come up with useful expressions for the, uh, the energy that is useful for heating the float, and the energy losses can be expressed as well. One significant difference between the concentrated uh, collector and the flat plate collector is the high temperature that we have in the concentrating collector. So this is one thing that we should keep in mind. And the high temperature would mean that thermal radiation is significant here, leading to loss coefficient being temperature dependent. If you are talking about uh, a loss coefficient here, and if we are talking about Radiation, radiation is a function to temperature to the power of four, so it will be highly dependent on the temperature in this case. Example is given here for calculating the losses and the loss coefficient UL by considering an uncovered cylindrical absorbing tube used as a receiver with a linear concentrator. So you have a linear concentrator, which is reflecting the energy on a cylindrical tube, which is the receiver here for this case. The fluid is inside the tube and the fluid is to be heated. So assuming that the receiver tube is at a uniform temperature, so along the length, the temperature does not change. The loss and the loss coefficient 
considering convection and radiation from the surface conducting through the support is given by that expression here. The first term in this equation, we are talking about the Q loss. The first term of the equation here is the wind loss coefficient. This is how heat transfer is going from this cylinder to the wind which is blowing here, air. So this is convection heat transfer from the receiver surface to the air. And the second term is taking care of radiation losses from this to the surrounding sky. So convection losses, radiation losses, we have seen this before. The last term is taking care of the conduction. So the conduction losses is given in terms of an overall heat transfer coefficient to represent the conduction into the receiver temperature minus Ta, assuming that uh, the conduction is being uh, occurring between this temperature and another surface at the air temperature. So we have convection, radiation, and conduction losses here. The, the radiation expression here can be linearized and given in terms of uh, HR into a temperature difference. Accordingly, you can combine TR minus TA can be taken as a constant, and then you can combine H by air, wind loss coefficient, radiation, and conduction losses can be all combined in a shape like this, where the combination of the three makes our overall loss coefficient. Where the linearized expression for the radiation is given here, which means that what you, what you do here, you try to put this equation in the form of HR into a temperature difference, which is TR minus TA. And accordingly, the HR is going to be given by what you see here in equation 732. So this is the linearized, linearized radiation uh, coefficient or loss coefficient. You would not accept a single value for the UL because there's large temperature gradient in the flow direction. The fluid enters at a temperature and leaves at a completely different temperature. The range of temperature increases significantly. So the collector can be to, to, to overcome this problem, you can cut the collector into several pieces and each piece you can apply this equation into so that you can have several segments or several parts where each part having a constant value of UL. The UL for the next segment is going to be different, but it will be a fixed value. For the next one is going to be different, but a fixed value. So it's, it's like what you do in a numerical uh, kind of uh, of, of problem application that you try first to create what we call the nodal network, a mesh. The mesh is dividing the shape that you have the geometry into several parts. Each part is going to have like a uniform temperature. And accordingly, its overall heat loss coefficient is going to be determined. The next part is having a different temperature. So the value of UL is different and so on. To be more accurate, you need to have more parts. You make your segments smaller, and this is how you can, the accuracy of your calculations can improve. The estimation of HW for cylinders is uh, seen in section 315 in chapter uh, three. We have gone through this revision and how to calculate the overall heat, the, the convection heat uh, coefficient to, from the surface of the receiver to the wind. Uh, you start with calculating the Lewis number. You can determine whether the flow is laminar or turbulent, and then you select the right correlation for the Nusselt number. And then from Nusselt number, you are going to calculate the value of H. Estimation of the conductive losses can be based on the knowledge of the construction details, how the, how the geometry for conductions, how the cross sections are looking like, what is the material that's being used. Then you can come up with an estimation of the conduction losses there. Linear concentrators can be fitted with cylindrical absorbers surrounded by transparent tubular covers to reduce convection losses. A collector of a length L, the heat transfer from the receiver at TR, temperature at the receiver surface, to the inside fluid 
can be done by having heat conduction through the, uh, the, the tubular material, the, the, uh, the tube material, so conduction here, and then convection from the inner surface to the fluid. So from the outer surface to the inner fluid, then we have a couple of resistances, conduction and convection. Then from that surface to the other surroundings of outward, then it will be following the UL expression that we have covered a while ago in the previous slide. So what you see here is what it takes to make the calculations between TR, which is the uh, temperature of the receiver, to the temperature of the cover, interior temperature of the cover. You are talking about a receiver here, and this receiver is covered by a glass cover here. So there is heat transfer from this surface to this surface. This is TR. And this is basically TCI, that's the inner temperature of the cover. So the transfer of energy from this point to this point can be accounted by this. Here, this looks like a conduction resistance, which is, which is the case, but it is using K effective, which means that here we are considering the radiation, or sorry, the, the, the losses by conduction, but the K effective here, which is talking about the air, this distance could be too small that Raleigh number is, 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 is less than the critical value and there's no convective motion of the air inside. Accordingly, it would be basically stagnant air and the mode of heat transfer will be conduction. That's why the word FK effective is being used here. And this is nothing but Fourier law of conduction applied to a cylindrical system here, going from an, an outer and an inner diameter, which is dr, to an outer diameter of the annulus, which is the inner surface tem temperature of that cover. And the second expression is the uh, radiation heat transfer between this point or this surface and that surface. So here we have conduction. It's not only conduction, actually, it's a combination of conduction and convection and radiation between the two surfaces. These losses also are, we're talking about heat transfer from this point or from this location to this location here, from in to the out, from the surface of the uh, receiver to the outside. So there is heat loss from here to the inner surface, and there is energy losses across this thickness of the cover, which is basically conduction heat transfer. And this is 2 pi Kc, which means thermal conductivity of the cover material, of this cylindrical cover material. The temperature difference between Tc uh, inner and Tc outer. Tc outer is the outer surface here, temperature, divided by len of the ratio between the diameters. So this here is from or in between the receiver and the inner surface of the cover. This is across the cover, and this one here is taking care of the energy loss from the outer surface of the cover to the surroundings. So there's heat transfer to the wind and by convection, and there is heat transfer to the sky by radiation. And these are the two expressions that we have here. So the three equations, 733, 734, 735, are representing one-dimensional heat loss, which is occurring from the receiver surface to the surroundings outside. But it is because it's one dimensional, Q is the same, Q is constant, and Q here is divided into three pieces. One of them is taking care of the uh, both conduction, convection, and radiation exchange between the receiver and the inner surface of the cover, then conduction through the cover, and then from the cover to the surroundings, we have both convection to the wind and radiation to the sky. And the three are equal. And this is the key for solving a one-dimensional heat transfer problem. The cover thermal conductivity, Kc, and K effective is an if, is, 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 uh, Kc, it depends on the, the material itself. If it is made of glass, then we'll look at Kc, which is thermal conductivity of the glass, which is close to one. Uh, watt per meter Kelvin, for example. 
key effective is an effective conductivity for the convection between the receiver and the cover. And that is being calculated as a maximum of uh, one or this kind of relation, which is a combination of Prandtl and Rayleigh star, where Rayleigh star is basically a modified Rayleigh number based on the geometry. These equations are basically obtained from figure from chapter three for losses in, in this shape, in cylindrical uh, shape covers. If the analysis is evacuated, if here we have vacuum, then K effective is going to be zero. And accordingly, the mode of radiation is going to be only that, or the mode of heat loss is going to be only radiation. So if it is filled with air, then this is the expression to be used. If it is evacuated, then this resistance is not going to be there because simply there's no medium. And as long as there's no medium, there is no conduction and no convection. The procedures that are going to be done. I'll talk the procedure about the procedure today. And in our next class, we are going to go through um, an example, a numeric example where we can utilize this procedure and try to apply it. So the procedure used is for solving this set of equations, three, three to three, five, is by estimating a temperature TC out first, which is outer temperature of the cover we said before that we have the receiver and then we have the cover. The cover is basically having an inner diameter and an outer diameter. So this one is TC in and this one is TC out. So what we are going to begin with is assume a value of TC out. Outside here, there's the air. So TC out is going to be close to the temperature of the air than the temperature of the receiver. So we're going to assume this value, TC out. And then we are going to substitute in equation 735 to calculate the loss. 735 is this. And once you estimated the value of Tc out, definitely T temperature of the air is known and temperature of the sky is known. So from here, we can calculate the value of Q loss from here. Take this Q loss here and substitute in equation 734 to calculate the value of Tci. Then take the value of TCI and substitute it here to calculate Q loss. If the Q loss that you have calculated here is close to the Q loss that you have calculated here, then it's fine. Otherwise, change the value of TC out and repeat the iteration again. So it will be an iterative solution that will start with estimation of TC out. After we do that, we calculate the Q loss from here, from this equation. After calculating the Q loss, we substitute in this equation to get the TCN, the value of TCN, T cover N, N the temperature of the cover is going to be used in the first equation to calculate Q loss again. So we calculated Q loss here and we are calculating Q loss here and compare between both of them. And believe me, it is so sensitive to temperatures that normally you try to do iterations so it's not converging from the first time. And normally you need to reiterate until you reach conversion here. But why is that? Because the temperature variations can result in substantial variations in Q loss. And accordingly, it's, it requires to be uh, iterated. Definitely, if you are going to put into an iterative solver like engineering equation solver, it can, it can solve it for you uh, just right away. But in terms of hand calculations, this is what we need to do. And this is what we need to begin with in our, in our class next time, inshallah, looking at the examples. Um, right here, I, I, we reach to the end of our, of our talk today. And I probably need to remind you of, uh, uh, I've already made available the special assignment or the term project for the course. And only four of you have uh, grouped themselves into a couple of, uh, of teams. Please make sure you complete your team um, uh, names today. Otherwise, I'll have to assign the teams myself so that you can get started in uh, working on the project and to submit it on time, inshallah. Questions? 